Thank you for watching video from One Church of High Point. We hope that today's message encourages you to connect to God, to others, and to your purpose. If you're looking for more information about One Church or for more resources, visit onechurchnc.net. I'd say I love, I love worship. I just love being in the community of believers. There's nothing else better than being with a group of people who love our Lord and Savior. Amen, church? Amen, amen. Y'all better get used to this. Because once we get to heaven, that's all we're going to do. 24 hours, seven days a week, 365. You know, there's not even time in heaven, right? All we're going to be doing is worshiping our God. And so if you're tired now, I need you to do some aerobics, amen? Some spiritual aerobics. If you need to jog in place real quick, do some calisthenics, whatever you need to do, I need you to be ready. Because we will be before our Lord, our God, our Savior. What better place to be than to be in the house of the Lord? Man. You know, as a father, um, there's times that... um, I can recall where I used to take our kids to, like, you know, just to their, their yearly checkup, right? Their annual exams or their bi- biannual exams. And, you know, we, we take them in and we kind of, you know, the doctor examines them. And, you know, it's, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Those who have kids, can I get amen? Kids just a money pocket, man. They just, they just drain your pockets. I mean, you know, you, you hope that they're a tax write-off, but you don't have enough to have a good tax write-off. So you got to have more or practice at having more. Come on, church, amen. Ministry happens. Um, man, I tell you. But, you know, when we take them to the doctors, you know, they, they weigh them, they, they measure them, they poke, they pry, they, you know, they get evaluated to see how well they're growing. And, you know, that's just that's what they're, they're due when they, you know, they are like babies and teenagers and infants and toddlers and all that great stuff. And I remember asking the doctor, why are my children sleeping so much? Like, man, these jokers, all they do, they do two things, eat, sleep, and you know what, the other thing, right? That's all they do. And I begin to understand, you know, the doctor be telling me, like, they're like, Ryan, this, this is a process that children go through to grow and to develop themselves. Are you kidding me? Like, eat and sleep, that's all they have to do? You know, over the summertime, typically what happens is that, you know, they, they go home for the summer because, they, you know, no school throughout the week and they're sleeping more. They're staying in later. They're staying up later. They're sleeping in later. And there's that growth spurt that happens because they're sleeping over time. They're getting more sleeping over the summer than they are during the entire school year. And so I begin to realize what the doctor is saying, that there's some growing that's associated to our rest. The doctor simply said that resting is necessary for growth. You mean to tell me that growing and resting goes hand in hand? He's like, yes, it does. You know, one one, one of another things as a a father and a parent of of children, you know, we get to kind of post pictures on them on social media things, right? You know, and we get to post pictures like what you're about to see right here. Oh, they're going to kill me. Oh, they're going to get me. It's coming. Oh, yes. My babies. I can do that because I'm the pastor and they daddy, amen? And this is what you call payback. All that stuff they used to give you growing up, you know, just kind of just raising it through. But what, what this picture really depicts is that, you know, this is one of our, our older house. And then, y'all see Kendall? <laughs> My baby girl got some boots on and some pajamas that was like three years expired, amen? <laughs> and it was snowing that day. Ashton, he got some high water zone, probably got some ashy ankles. I don't know what's going on. But this just reminds me how they had like a growth spurt over, over the years, right? I love you guys. My kid's like, oh, dad, man. But I'm just reminded how fast they grow. You know, we can look back at pictures through our timelines and we get to see how 
our children grow and how they continue just to grow, not only just physically, but also spiritually. And we see all throughout Scripture where the Scriptures are telling us that we need to rest. That the Bible tells us that we need to slow down and just rest. As we enter into um, this month, this month we are walking into a new sermon series called Four Letter Words. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Four letter words. And so today, just the focus of my scripture is rest. R-E-S-T. The Bible is replete about scriptures and how they tell us that we should rest or we should Sabbath. Exodus chapter 33 tells us that I will go with you and give you rest. Psalms 55 tells us that I will fly away and be at rest. Psalm 62 tells us that my soul rests in God. Psalms chapter 127 tells us that he grants us sleep or rest to those he loves. The Apostle Matthew writes that he will find rest for your souls. There remains a Sabbath rest for God's people, Hebrews chapter 4. But we all know Psalms 23, right? We grew up kind of reciting this for those who kind of grew up in church. You know, we know Psalms 23. My Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. But then I, I've read and learned the scripture for, for decades. And I, and I went back and read it just this past week because I've just been prepping all weekend as I've been preparing this week and I'm preparing about rest, I've been struggling just to get rest. I often say most of the scriptures, most, most of the passages that I preach, I'm preaching to myself. So I'm not preaching to, I may be preaching to the choir, but more likely I am preaching to myself. That God is telling me, Ryan, I need you to rest. I need you to slow down. I need you to really embody my presence, the imago day, the, the image of God. I need you to rest. And as I go back and remember, just look at Psalms chapter 23. Psalms 23, the very passage itself says this. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. But think about that. He makes. What is it, God? You're making me? That's not the type of God we want where he's making you to do something. The scripture says he maketh, King James Version. He's making you to lie down in green pastures. Why, God? Why, do, why are you telling me to go take a nap and get a snack? Amen? I love that, Pastor St. <laughs> A couple weeks ago, Pastor St. preached out of 1 Kings, and he's talking about, you know, where um, Elijah had to go, you know, get fed by ravens and so forth and so forth, that he lay down and took a nap and a snack. But in Psalms chapter 23, David is writing that the Lord is making him to lie down in a pillow top mattress <laughs> provided by Hilton Hotels. Amen, somebody. Yes, sir. The only hotel chain. Amen. Oh, Little plug. Sorry. Inside joke. I begin to say, God, if you are a father and you know what's best for us, then yes, I would take a rest. I never realized that our God can be so aggressive towards his children. But why can't he? Hebrews talks about where God, he, he chases those he love, right? That God can correct us because he loves us. I remember growing up, my mama, whenever she um, spared a rod, spoiled a child. She says that she only spares a rod because she loves us. 
I really didn't begin to understand what she was saying by that until I had two of my own. That we spare the rod, we spoil the child, that what the scripture is saying, that because we love our children, that we love our community of believers, the community that we have, correction and ultimately a mandate will come. And so mandates like living a righteous lifestyle. Mandates to say that, you know, we are pursuing Christ. And so as we begin to look at our, our study for today, the focus of our lesson is going to come out of Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus is in the beginning of the Bible, technically the first, second book, second book, Genesis, Exodus. Verse 8 reads, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Hmm. He didn't say wife. Amen. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Oh, I'm going to get some emails. If y'all want to email us, it's admin at one church. In, I'm just joking. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the, made the heavens and the earth. He made the sea and all that's in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath. He blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Hmm. God outlines 10 commandments. We know Exodus chapter 20 is typically known for the Ten Commandments, right? He outlines Ten Commandments, and in those, he, he's talking about what is necessary to have a right relationship with him, then also what's a right relationship with others. If you look at the core of Ten Commandments, it's divided into two separate parts. Your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. And he's outlining specifically what is necessary to have a a very healthy relationship with him. You know, you should have no other gods before me. You should not make idols. You should not take the name Lord God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your mother and your father. I heard that a hundred times when I was growing up. You shall not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should, never, you should not bear false witness. You should not covet the Ten Commandments. And out of those Ten Commandments, our God, our Lord, and our Savior found it pleasing to put in there that you should rest. He said that we should rest. And I'm like, God, why is that so important? And I get it. You know, we, we live in a, in a culture where it's always hustle and bustle that we're going from A to Z and we're going, we're doing this, we're doing that. We have to have five different jobs. We got to have six different side hustles. We got to bring in multiple streams of income. You know, we got to do this in the morning, come back at night. There's so many things that we're doing day after day that we don't have time to rest. Dealing with family, dealing with kids, dealing with work. Dealing with bills, cars that break down. But yet, in the core crux of what he's telling the Old Testament believers to do, the most, one of the most important things out of the 10 is to rest. I'm part of a generation growing up where I can remember back in my day where on Sundays, stores were like closed. 
Y'all remember that? Even the ABC store. Come on now, y'all know what I'm talking about. You, I remember, like, you can't even go into the grocery stores and buy, you know, a little wine for your stomach, you know, a little henny of cognac, whatever, whatever. I mean, you know. Oh, come on, people. Don't trip. Keep it real. I remember growing up that, like, on Sunday, nothing was opened. And we, we got that from the scriptures. They pulled it from the scriptures because they wanted to keep the Sabbath holy. That means they didn't want to do any work on Sundays whatsoever. In 1967, Truett Cathy opened up an amazing restaurant. And this pioneer of restaurants saw that it was super important to close on Sundays so that all of his employees could set aside one day to rest and to worship. And to this day, we can't leave church, go down to the, gold, or the Red Arches and get a chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A. Because the CEO and president and the owner who started this franchise saw value in resting. Arguably the most successful restaurant to date. Even more successful than that place that you go to to get coffee that's, I will name nameless, that starts with an S. I know we got some people that work there, so I'm throwing, you know, I'm just. They saw it that it's so important to pull back because they, we know in scriptures, God worked for six days, but on the seventh day, he rested. And I get it. You're looking at someone who, as a marketplace leader, full-time in ministry, as we're ramp ramping up and launching ministries and doing different things, I was full out 160% nonstop. My wife, my kids, some staff members would tell you, I was always going, going, going. Bible studies, meetings, elders meetings, staff meetings. I was on four different board of directors. Four different board of director boards, leadership meetings, community meetings. And one of my mentors told me, said, they said this, Ryan, you cannot keep up the pace that you're going. They said, your team cannot keep that pace. He said, although that you can keep that pace, but your team cannot keep up with you. It's detrimental to their health. It's detrimental to their families. And it's detrimental to their, to their, to their walk with God. They said, you're going to have to stop what you're doing. And my response to him was, look, it's too much to do. I'll stop when I die. It's too much ministry. It's too many souls that has to be saved in this community. I will stop when I die. You know what? The devil is too busy. Then they said this. Why are you making the devil your role model? I'm like, man. My mentor told me, Ryan, why are you making the devil your role model? He said, the devil's busy, but God rested. Man, I punched out and I went home. <laughs> I, was, I was done, right? Don't you hate when people preach your own sermon back at you? I'm like, why are you preaching? I'm, I'm preaching to you. Don't be preaching to me. I was being preached at yesterday with Felicia and I you know, on a Zoom call, preaching right back at me. They were just throwing stuff right back at me. I'm like, man, I was trying to bob and weave. I was up against the ropes. I'm like, man, what's going on? I was so busy trying to do ministry or actually doing ministry 
but I was forsaking my time with God. I was so busy doing ministry that I was forsaking my wife. I was so busy doing ministry that I was forsaking my, my family for the sake of the gospel. Like there's somebody else that has to hear the good news. They're like, Ryan, that's not of God. We need a rest. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. So if God rested, why don't we? If God pulled back one day and rested, why don't we? Rested in Hebrew, in this context, in verse 2, where it says he rested. Rested in Hebrew is Shabbat. S-H-A-B-A-T-H. That word by itself means to stop. It means to cease. This is where we get the word Sabbath. God was saying that I will cease doing anything else but to rest. So you mean to tell me growth and rest goes hand in hand. If you're growing as a, a young person, that growth spurt, and over that summer you, you grow two or three inches because you're resting more. If you get it, I don't have to preach as long. If you're resting in the Lord, growth would take place. If you're resting in his word, if you're abiding in his word, growth will take place. Okay. 1965, Motown artist Sam Cooke wrote one of the most prolific songs of the time. This was a protest to the support, actually the support protest of the civil rights movement as People of color was fighting for equality. So my attempt in a Sam Cooke voice, it says, <clears throat> hold on real quick. <laughs> Who said that over here? <laughs> they told me not. Y'all don't have faith in your pastor? I'm, I'm good for at least one note, right? Come on now. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sam Cook says that he was born by a river. I'm going to call Jay up here in a minute, boy, because Jay going to blow it for me. Man. And he says, oh, just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming. Yeah, well, go back and, and YouTube it, guys. It seems, sounds a lot better. <laughs> but what Sam Cooke was saying is that it's been a long, long time coming, but I know change is going to come. Church today, change has to come. Change that we desire to grow and to walk in what God has called us to do and what God has called us to become. It's a long time coming. Because this world need change. And that change starts with us. The change starts with you. 
that change starts when you're abiding and resting, when you're Sabbathing with our Lord and our God. So to grow, to rest, the first thing you would need is time. You need to recognize the time that you need to stop and rest. I remember taking a trip with my family sometime, some years ago, and I was with my grandparents, and this is how far, I mean, my brother and I, we just got our license. We we're probably 16 or 17 years old, and we was driving from North Carolina to back to Michigan, where my grandparents were from. And my granddad, he's like, you know, let, let the twins, they can ride, you know. So I got in one car, I got into my grandfather's car. He was driving a nice little Cadillac or something, whatever it was, a nice little stretch thing. And my brother was taking point. And typically when you're driving with two or three people, there's always a point car, then there's a second car. You know, you bob and weave to kind of block and move. You know, those are like unspoken rules of how to, you know, okay, we'll talk after church. But we're driving and next thing you know, Brian's taking point, and I'm, I keep falling further back. And what was taking place, I was tired. And I, was, I started to doze off, and the next thing you know, I speed back up. And then I started pulling back some more. Brian kept his speed, but for some reason, I kept going back and forth. And my grandfather told my mother, he said, I can't call her by her first name because I might get in trouble, but, you know, he's tired. It's time for him to rest. Because we won't make our destination safely if we keep allowing him to go in the direction that he's going. So let me put it to you this way. Your rest is connected to other people. How well you rest is connected to myself and everyone else in here. So I need you to rest. And so eventually what I do, I'll pull over and I begin to switch out drivers and took a three, four hour nap, got back in the driver's street. We rolled up into Michigan and everything else is history. Scripture tells us that on the seventh day, God ended his work in which he has made. Then he rested on that seventh day. God rested on the seventh day because he needed to rest after creating all that he did in six days. We work 40 hours a weekend. We need to take a nap, right? God created everything that is everything to be. It's not the Big Bang Theory. It's not anything else that the science may try to tell you. God created everything, and he rested. To do this, we need time. We need to know when it's time to rest. Let me give you another analogy. Farmers know that you can't continue to farm the same field the same way year after year. You can't sow the same seed and expect to get the same product out of that that soil because what happens is that that soil has a tendency that where it needs to rest. So what the farmers do, they either plant something different in a different season or they don't plant anything in that field at all so that way the field itself can rest. The dirt itself needed to rest. So the farmer knew that to produce the harvest that he was anticipating and needed to rest, the dirt that was retaining the seed. So somewhere back in Genesis, it says that God bent down, picked up some dirt, formed us, and blew his breath in us. So if a farmer needs to rest his field and we're created out of dirt, why can't we need to rest? You'll get it next week. It's okay. Let me connect the dots for you. If we're created out of dirt, and the dirt that we're we're sowing season to needs to rest, God is telling us that we need to rest. Rest is not a reward of progress. Rest is a reward of the promise. Rest is not the reward of progress, but rest is a reward of the promise. The promise where God says that we should rest. He says that in verse 3, God blessed. This is going back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 says this, verse 3. The promise that we have is this. 
And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all of his work, which God created and made. There's a blessing and a sanctification in the resting that we have. He said that he blessed and sanctified. He set it apart on the seventh day. I begin to look at um, Exodus differently. The commandment tells us in Exodus chapter 20 that he commands us to rest. But this isn't the first time that he, we see in scriptures where we rested. Go back to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, we'll begin to see the Israelites walking through the wilderness, right? Y'all remember the story where walking through the wilderness and they didn't have anything to eat? And what did God tell them to do? He gave them manna, right? He gave them manna daily. Except for what day? On the seventh day. So I'm like, God, okay, the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 tells us that we need to have a Sabbath day. But on the, in Exodus chapter 16, where the children of Israel are walking through the wilderness and you gave them manna daily. But on the sixth day, you gave them double portion. What God was doing was this. He wanted you and I to understand that we have to trust that he would provide for us. Even while we're resting. That you don't have to do anything that God's going to provide for you. Even when you need to rest, that God is providing for you while you're sleeping, while you're resting, while you're Sabbathing. So if you are a control person that has to do everything, that it won't go the way that you needed to go, God said, take your hands off of it. I got this. I need you to rest. Scripture says, every morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. They were living from manna to manna, 21st century, from paycheck to paycheck. Been there, done that. Know how it is. The children of Israel was collecting man on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, but on the sixth day, God said, trust me. I will provide for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says this. So do not worry or saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He says, but seek his kingdom. Seek his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But he says this, but first seek. First seek. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. You need time for rest and you have to trust that God has everything under control while you're resting. God is saying, just trust me. God is saying, just trust me. But there are those, I'm sure as Israelites, on the sixth day, guess what they were trying to do? They were trying to pack up more and more and more because they didn't trust God. That FOMO, right? That fear of missing out. That they were trying to hoard as much as they could just as fear, just in case God doesn't deliver on his word. God, just in case, you, you know, you don't know my entire situation, God. You, so let me get more than I need just, just in case to hold me by just a little while longer. Maybe you're that person who can't trust God. Maybe you're that person who can't trust God because maybe God has let you down in the past. But let me remind you, God never lets you down. It's just that your plans wasn't his plans. 
So when you begin to align your plans with his plans, then, then you begin to have that revelation that my God always provides for me. You begin to have the understanding that, that my God will always do what he says that he's going to do because his word would not return void. Yes. Then God always give you more than you're able to have. Yes. It's pressed down, shaken, stirred, running over, right, church? That's how the God of the heavens and the earth operates. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. But it only happens when you're resting in him. Let me give you some benefits of resting. Some benefits of, of kind of getting adequate rest. You get to have a, a healthier heart, weight control. You might be a little bit smarter. It says your brain gets a little sharpened, you know, amen. It reduces the stress. It helps you to think clearer. You might be in a better mood. Don't look at anybody to your right, your left, just keep looking straight. It helps you to make better decisions. This is what rest does for your soul. When he says that he rested, he Sabbath, he ceased from doing anything. Last year, I was invited to a pastor's retreat. I was telling our, our leadership team about this about nine months ago. And I left on a, a Tuesday, about 4 o'clock. It was in Stoneville. Got there about 4.30, 4.45, because it's about 45 minutes away. From, 44, from 4.45 Tuesday to 11 o'clock on, on Wednesday was the best 20 hours that I've ever had in my life. The facilitator was asking us to do certain things. And we really looked at one passage of the scripture and it just said to be still. Yes. To be still. And so he began to ask us questions about what that would look like and ask us questions. And he asked us, what are you defined by? What's your identity and who is your identity? Your identity is not your, your, your clergy status or the degrees that you have on the wall or the, the accolades that you've acquired over the years. So those are not your identity. He said, this is what I want you to do. This is, this is your first assignment. He said, I want you to go outside. And this is like in a retreat area. So it's all out in the wilderness. And it's the word, the, you know, the, it's just the woods and the birds and, you know, foxes and bears and deer, you know, all, you know, the wilderness. <laughs> and so he said, this is what I want you to do. Go outside. Spend about 10 to 15 minutes. You guys just find your own little place, little, own, your own little area. And then come back and let me know what what God says to you. He said, I want you to just to be still. Be still and rest. I said, okay, I can do this. And now if your mind like me starts drifting away, reel it back in. It's okay, I get out there. I go outside. I sit down on this, this park bench and it's kind of chilly. So I put my hoodie on, got my, my, my fitted cap on and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, be still, know that I'm God. Be still, know that I'm God. I'm just repeating the scripture. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still. That, okay, I got to go do this. I got to have this meeting. Oh, my gosh, I got to go take care of this person. I got to do this for the elders. Okay, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me reel it back in. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. Oh, my gosh, I got to make sure Ashton has this. Kindle. I got to, no, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. My mind is chasing. I stopped. I took a deep breath. I exhale, close my eyes. And next thing you know, I begin to feel the sun begin to shine down on me. I felt the heat from the sun. I hear the wind rustling because of the leaves behind me. And I feel, I hear water dripping back and cascading in a, in a fountain right behind me. And I'm just kind of just taking it all in. I begin to slow everything down. Three minutes later, I begin to weep. Because I got in a posture to see Christ. I begin to get down, and my mind is clear. And God's begin to speak into me. I begin to rest in his presence. 
the cares of the world is gone away. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I am Lord. Abide in me and know that I am there. Know that I will not leave you, nor forsake you. And I just begin to weep and I just begin to keep crying. And I'm like, God, why did it take so long for me to get back to this place? This place that I've longed for. This place where I begin to slow down and feel his presence. I begin to repent. My God, I'm sorry. It shouldn't take me coming to a retreat center to remove the distractions of life to fully be in your presence. And you may be looking like, you the pastor. I'm a child of God. I'm a man. I'm human. I sin. I got some crazy thoughts. But at the end of the day, he redeems and restores. So that day, from that, from that day forward, I made a promise to myself, my wife, and our leadership team where I would take one day a month where I would get ghost. Okay, ghosts get missing, no longer, no one can get a kind, you know, ghost. I called Felicia, I said, Felicia, I'm going out, I'm going to the mountains or to the beach or to the lake or I'll drive to a cabin somewhere. I'll go to Victory Mountain Camp or I just get missing. I take my Bible and that's it, in a notepad. While I'm going to retreat to rest on this particular day, I don't answer any phone calls while I'm driving to this place. She knows where I'm going and when I'm finished. Because I don't want to take any phone calls, look at any emails that's going to shape what, going to shape my thoughts for those next six or eight or 12 hours. Amen. So church, today, as we kick off our sermon series, the four letter words, as our worship team make their way to the stage, I want to encourage you to rest. Maybe you don't know how to. Maybe you don't know, or maybe you've forgotten what that is. Maybe all oh, hell is breaking loose in your life right now. Maybe the cares and the weightiness of the world is just weighing you down. Maybe you don't know where your next paycheck is going to come. Maybe you don't know what's going to happen with your children. Maybe you don't know what's going to happen with your family. Maybe you're dealing with some type of sickness or some disease or something. Like maybe you just forgot who God is. I will encourage you to rest. I'm reminded of a story about a gangster, which many of us kind of know. His name is Al Capone. Al Capone is one of the most notorious gangsters in the American culture. He's done some things that he's going to have to answer for. Greed, lust, murder, death. Death was certain for him. Death was knocking at his door. Al Capone was asked this one question. The question that was asked to Al Capone was this. What do you want etched on your tombstone? Al Capone sat there and just thought about it for a second. And he says this. My Jesus, mercy. Like you probably like me. Being judgmental. I didn't think Al Capone knew Jesus. Because the fruit that he was displaying doesn't show that he knew who Christ was. But his response was that my Jesus, mercy. 
Al Capone knew that he missed much of his life pursuing things that really didn't matter. That he was chasing after things that really didn't matter. That he was pursuing things that took time away from him. Maybe you're pursuing things that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme things of the kingdom. Chasing career, money, family. That's great, but you can't take it to heaven. He knew that he had missed the mark, that if he could rewrite his story, that he would pursue things differently. He knew that he will rest more. And I will probably even say that he will even serve God even the more. That's what mercy is like. Mercy is when you miss the mark. But God says, come anyway. Mercy says, when you jacked up last night, but come anyway. Mercy says, when you acting like a fool, like you're just acting crazy, but come anyway. That's what mercy is. When you're acting as ratchet as all ratchet is. Come on now. I'm going to speak every language this morning. Muy mal. That's all I know. Amen. No bueno. <laughs> when you're doing things that transgresses our God's heart, that's what mercy is. He says, come anyway. Jesus, my Jesus have mercy. I believe Al Capone was saying this. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way with my life. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Santis gave us a chip where he said that um, this poker analogy talks about when you are playing cards with you or whatever, that you have an opportunity to kind of like cast all your chips in. And he gave a, a commission to say, are you willing to be all in today? So I took one of these chips, grateful to see the overwhelming response by the church. That was February 11, 2024. And on my chip, I just put down, I'm all in. I'm gonna be honest, there's just times where I'm not. Where I'm not all in where the weight of life and family and ministry has you pull away sometimes. Can I get amen, church? When life just happens where you're trying to be all in, but you can't because life is happening to you. I'm all in. And so when we sing this song, Lord, have your way, we're saying, God, I'm all in. We have some chips up here earlier this week. We're going to bring them back. And I just, so you may not get them this week, but come by, come back next week. And I was talking to a few people. I'm like, why didn't you go up there to get a chip? They're like, I was, I was afraid. I'm like, but this is family. And so next week, we're going to have more chips up here just to remind you that you have the opportunity to be all in for Christ. He said you can be all in for Christ. He wants you to be all in for one church. He wants you to be all in for what God has called you to do. And so this morning as we stand to our feet, this is the four-letter word series that the growth that we desire comes in when we rest. The growth that you're seeking, the growth that you're desiring comes when you're resting and abiding in Christ. 
Because apart from him, you cannot grow. And so today, as we worship together this one last song, we're going to cry out, Lord, have your way. We're going to proclaim, God, have your way with me today. So this altar is free. This is safe space where you want to come up here and rededicate your life. Come to the altar, rededicate your life. Pastors, elders, and deacons are here. We want to pray with you. We want to have the opportunity to walk alongside you and do life with you. I don't know what's going on with your life right now, but I promise you something's going on. But God says, give it to me. That's where mercy comes in. So today, Father, we thank you, God, for who you are. God, we're asking you to have your way with us. So as we lift up this song this morning, God, we're asking that you can do what only you can do. God, you know what's going on in the lives of your children. Father, I pray, God, that you meet them right where they are, just like the woman at the well, just like the woman with the issue of blood. God, you met her in her mess, in her worst position possible. So, God, you let us know that you meet us right where we are, God, right when we are broken, where we're, where we're desperate, crying out for you, God, that you can meet us right where we are. So, Father, have your way with us. God, we're saying that we're all in. Even when we missed it, we're all in. God, have your way. We'll give you the glory and the honor. Amen. Thank you for watching today's video. If you made a commitment of any kind or you made a first time decision to accept Christ, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at onechurchnc.net. If today's message encouraged you, we want to encourage you to give so that we can continue to share the hope of Jesus. You can do that by visiting onechurchnc.net slash give.